Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and we're here for my NACL playoffs round two overview and analysis. Really excited to go over these games. Of course, uh, title be damned. It's actually not just round two. We still have to get through losers round one as well before we jump into winners round two, but we'll be covering all eight of those games in this video from last weekend. Of course, broke that up. Had a video come out on Monday of this week, kind of going over my winners round one. So if you want to get a good idea of how all of these teams played in their first series of the playoffs here, you can go ahead and check that out up in the iCard right now. But in this video, we're going to be going over losers round one, seeing the first teams that are officially eliminated from the playoffs here. And then we will also be talking about winners round two, to see who's going to be moving on to what is uh, essentially the winner's top four. Obviously, you really want to be there if you can, and uh, it's definitely going to be interesting to see which teams can make that a reality. But before we jump into anything, let me know down in the comments section below what you guys thought of these games. Of course, it's one weekend's full of games. It's a little bit different in terms of the round structure, but we'll be going over all eight series in this video, talking about the, the, the positives, the negatives, where I think teams might be moving on in the playoffs, of course. Remember, when we talk about these losers at first, the losers round one, whoever loses is out. Like, that is the bottom of the bracket. It's double elim, and those teams have already lost one series. When we get to the winners, obviously, it's not win or go home. You still survive. You just go down to loser's bracket. You lose that second life that you might be able to get. So, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Of course, starting off, we're going to kick everything off with losers round one first. We're going to cover all four of those series, and then we'll jump into winners later on in the video. So, Kicking us off our first series of losers round one, we had the number eight seeded Wildcard Gaming taking on the number 16 seeded CLG Faith, and Wildcard does sneak, sneak by in this series. Honestly, it was way closer than I ever expected it to be. CLG Faith, one of those teams that just has not looked competitive really at all over the course of the year so far, and there are points where Wildcard has looked like a top four, top five team in the NACL. I thought this was going to be an absolute blowout for Wildcard, but they actually drop game number one. Luckily for them, they're able to rebound, they're able to kind of get back on track, and they're able to win games two and three in pretty dominant fashion. But, you know, credit to CLG. Winning their second game of the year in the playoffs is a pretty good look, but uh, it, they're kind of ending up where we all expected them to be, which is out pretty early on. The first team officially eliminated from the playoffs. So let's go ahead and talk about what happened in this series? There are two players on the side of wildcard that I particularly want to shout out for being really good. My player of the series is going to end up going to Keel. Now, I know that a lot of people are going to want to give it to someone else on this team. And trust me, they also deserve it. But I got to give a ton of shout outs to Keel. He was a little bit worse in that game number one. They really wanted to play through him on the Belveth and they just could not get the pick going. A really good job by NXI to kind of handle that in the early game with the Kindred and make sure that the rest of the team actually did a good job getting online. Town was good in game number one. Bajani was good in game number one. Topside in general was just solid for CLGF in their win. But you get into games two and three and Keel completely takes over the map. I've talked about this before. Keel's Nunu is super fun to watch. Obviously, he's got quite the eclectic champion pool. He's got the Nunu. He's got the Karthus. He's got the Belveth. Those are the things that come to mind when you think of Keel and... You know, he pulls out a lot of that comfort in this series here. The Nunu game was spectacular. The Wukong game was just as good, in my opinion. Even with NXI performing at a relatively high level on the other side, it just felt like Keel was the big driving force for wildcard in this series. I know a lot of people are going to look at Lens and say that he was probably the most, you know, consistent, the, the big standout member of wildcard, and I can totally understand that. We'll talk about how you know, favorable bot lane was for wildcard in this series in just a minute, but I think people are going to underrate what Keel was able to do in games two and three. I think generally speaking, he's just been underrated almost the entire split. I've said it for a while now. I think Keel is wildcard's best player, and I think he has been over the course of the year. I definitely think that translated into their wins in games two and three, and I just think he's really good. He has fantastic synergy with Saligo in particular in the mid lane. Those two play off of each other really well. Saligo gets on his signature Oriana that he's been pulling out for years years in games two and three, and obviously he does a great job making sure that Keel has the ability to move around the map, play for the rest of the lane. Saligo is 
I'm more than happy to be a more supportive mid laner, somebody who's going to be roaming around the map, helping out the bot lane in this instance, sometimes the top lane, things like that, making sure the jungler can kind of do everything they want. Those two work together super well, and I think they're a big reason why Wildcard has ended up in such a high position, because the bot lane wasn't always working, the top lane wasn't always working, but it did always feel like the jungle mid was working. Maybe not every game in the series, game number one would have a word, but throughout the rest of the series, I would definitely say those two were the standout members. And then, of course, we have to talk about Lens and Duo King in general. They were the better bot lane by such a large margin in this series, even in game number one. It felt like Lens and Duo King were winning lane every single game. That Blitzcrank is just such a difficult pick to deal with. Duo King plays it at such a high level. That feels like a must ban against Wildcard now, which is crazy because there's so many things that you have to ban against Wildcard. The Garen comes to mind. Uh, you know, things like the Karthus come to mind if you really don't want to play against that. Adding Blitzcrank to that list just makes it so much more difficult to actually play into this team. But Lens's positioning has improved so much throughout the year. I'm not going to say that the bot lane was like a weakness for this team, because I certainly don't think they were losing them games, but I don't think that this was the kind of bot lane that was actively winning this team games for a lot of the year, especially with how volatile the top side of the map was for wildcard. So it's really good to see them kind of be the consistent damage, consistent carry threat on this team here. Overall, just really like what wildcard was able to do in this series. As for CLGF on the other side, they put up much more of a fight than I ever expected them to in this series. I did not think they were going to be all that competitive against wildcard, but they were able to take a game and they had some players that really stood out. I thought NXI in particular was really solid in this series. There were moments where other players looked good, but in the games that they lost, especially like a lot of these players ended up underperforming. Town had a pretty miserable game too. And Aaron and Sketch honestly just kind of got outplayed in this series. That's why my dead of the series is going to go to Sketch in that support position. I like the idea of Braum in these comps, especially pairing it up with something like MF. You certainly don't want them stealing that pick, but in general, playing the Braum into Blitz, like I get the idea, you're a tank, you would rather be hooked than your AD, but at the end of the day, like, <laughs> if you get hooked as Braum, especially early game, you're probably still going to die if they have the same kind of damage output, and that ended up happening a lot. I, I Again, I, idea-wise, I understand why they might have wanted to go in that direction. I just don't think it was executed in the way that maybe CLGF was really looking for. I think Aaron and Sketch were the weak points of CLGF in this series, which is unfortunate because I think they've maybe been the most consistent members of this team over the course of the year. But NXI looking okay. Town looked good in game one, but he was miserable the rest of the series. Bajani was just kind of a non-factor in the top lane. Top lane really wasn't all that important in the series. Overall, CLGF's main regular season is now done. They're going to be, you know, in the case for relegation. Uh, they are going to have to play a series to see if they get relegated, and my money is obviously on them not being able to win that series. They had a pretty miserable year in the NACL, only winning two games, if you include the one that they won here in game number one, and they just didn't really show a ton of improvement. There was a lot of turmoil when it came to this roster. None of these players really stood out. NXI had a pretty decent end of the year, but outside of that, there's really nobody on this team that I was really super excited about. I unfortunately would expect to not see this team in the NACL come summertime. And then for Wildcard, they move on here. Of course, they still have one life left, so they're moving on to the next round, to round two. I think that is good for them. This is about the place where we would expect them to be after that round one performance. I still am worried a bit about the consistency that comes with the team, as volatile as this. But with bot lane stepping up and looking good, Jungle Mid has been on a, a really big tear as of recently. Moose Hater's always going to have his crazy picks in the top lane. I think Wildcard is certainly not a team that anybody else in the tournament should be able to take lightly. Then moving on to our second series of Losers Round 1, and this one is the closest in terms of seeds. It's the number 12 seed taking on the number 13 seed. We had AOE Gold taking on Evil Geniuses Challengers, and AOE picks up the 2-1 series win. This was one of the ones I was most interested in seeing in Losers Round 1, if not the most interesting matchup in Losers Round 1, if only because I really could have seen either of these teams stepping up and coming out of the series with a win. I think both of them played relatively similarly across the regular season. They were both mildly successful teams that had good games here or there, were able to definitely dominate some of the teams that were underperforming, but in general just weren't teams that were actually taken all that seriously, uh, especially over the course of the back half of the regular season. AoE definitely improved. EG felt like they trailed off, so it was definitely kind of moving in opposite directions. But, you know, conversely, like, EG probably should have been the better team talent-wise. And so it was going to be interesting to see how this series ended up panning out. And it was AoE who ended up taking the 2-1 
series win here. It was a relatively close series. Game one was very close. Game two was not. Evil Geniuses kind of stomped that one. And then game three, pretty back and forth, but AoE definitely had control of it for the most part. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Starting with AoE, I think player of the series was pretty easy for me in this one. It's going to go to Skytech, the support here. For AoE, it's really good to see him perform, not only because he's kind of been a little bit inconsistent over the course of the year so far, but also because he's facing his former organization, his former team here in Evil Geniuses. It's really cool to see him kind of jump back in and actually play really well, especially in that game number three. Some of those rel engages were absolutely massive, in my opinion. He was absolutely the player of the game in that third and final one, the closing out game, which was super important because honestly, they didn't really have a lot of easy ways to get in. You have Oriana Shockwave. You do have the Wukong, which can be pretty big, obviously pairing that with like Oriana Ball. That can be a nice engage, but having Rel just really clears things up for how you want to play and get on the Zeri, maybe even get on the Akali or the Viego or something else in that third and final game. It makes a lot of those late game team fights a lot easier. And Skytech playing at a high level is super big for this AoE team. I've talked about them a lot over the course of the year. I've talked about Dark Wings in particular kind of being the central carry to how this team likes to play the game. Gomsu has games where he really steps up, but Lynx and Skytech have really been the difference makers, I would say, for AoE when they do win. The difference between them winning and losing is usually how this bot lane ends up turning out, and luckily for them in this series, it turned out pretty good. They were the better bot lane, and Skytech definitely proved that. Lynx was also really good going into Mobility, who has been fine, I would say, over the course of the split, but certainly not like a standout player. I thought both bot laners kind of did their job. Lynx was a little bit more aggressive in how he went about doing his job, but in general, I would say he was just as effective, if not more so, than whatever the ADC on the Evil Geniuses was actually putting out in this series. So Lynx and Skytech, definitely the standout members, but I, I would be remiss not to point out that my dud of the series is actually going to go to a player on AoE. It's going to go to Darkwings, because I think he had the single worst game of the series. It's not to say that I think he was awful. I actually don't think any of the 10 players in this series deserved it. I, I don't think any of them were dud of the series worthy. I thought everybody kind of did their part. I will say the mid laners were definitely the two candidates for me. Darkwings had a really bad game too. That Evil Genius's win was almost entirely just picking on Darkwings in the mid lane, and that was not a very good early game from him. But Ryoma, on the other side, didn't have a particularly good series either. If you wanted to give it to him, I totally would understand, but I'm going to give it to Darkwings just for that game too. He wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire in game one or game three either. So it just felt like he was probably the player with the least amount of impact on the series overall. Again, not to say that he was bad. If anything, like if Darkwings was your worst player with how he played in the series, that's a good sign overall. And that means both teams did step up at least in their own ways. But I just wasn't super impressed with what Darkwings was able to do. We know he can do much better, which is another reason why I feel very comfortable giving him the dud of the series here. But overall, AoE looking solid. The bot lane looking good. I think Topside was looking solid. Winnie had some really good games in this series. And overall, AoE is definitely have a they definitely have a pronounced play style I'm not exactly sure if it's going to carry them super far in this tournament but it, it was a good series overall for evil geniuses wasn't the worst way to go out but this is the end of your spring split which is about as disastrous as it can get let's be entirely honest let's take a big picture look at this evil geniuses team not only are you the first challengers team to be eliminated from the playoffs but like with this roster with this talent that you have on the team there is no excuse for that happening I understand that King was not available to play and he was not going to be able to play for playoffs but even with mobility in you've got Shaden who was one of the best junglers in the league last year you've got Ryoma who's an LCS vet Smoothie who's an LCS vet Soul who has shown a lot of promise at this level and has played at the LCS before like Evil Geniuses has no excuses for not being at the very least a mid-table team but they are not they are one of the worst teams in the NACL and they showed that in this series. It just wasn't a very convincing series. I loved game two from them. They absolutely dominated that game, but outside of that, they were super slow. It didn't feel like they had a lot of bite to them. They were playing scared, and honestly, that's kind of what I expected from this team after what we had seen in recent weeks. Shaden had been completely running it down towards the back half of the split. When Ryoma didn't win in the mid lane, this team often did not win games. Mobility, you know, for va has, as valiantly as he did stepping in for a player like King, who, you know, Mobility was never supposed to be the player on this team anyways. He just isn't going to be that AD that's going to push your team forward. Smoothie had a bad split. Soul had a bad split. Nobody was really clicking on this Evil Geniuses team. And I think this is really just the consequence of that. There really isn't one player that I can look at and point at and say, you're the reason they lost this series or you had a particularly bad game. They just didn't come together when it mattered the most. Their, their macro 
wasn't particularly good. Their aggressiveness wasn't particularly good. They looked like a team that deserved to be out in bottom four. And so that's what they are. They go 10 and 20 in the regular season. They are a bottom four team in playoffs. This organization and this team absolutely has to make improvements come summertime or else I, I don't really know. It might just be a full roster overhaul here. I would recommend obviously seeing what the team looks like with King in, with a bot laner that you can play around before you make any sweeping changes. But at least as of right now, like there are definitely some players that are on the hot seat. And I don't think I'm pretty crazy for saying that. As for AoE on the other side, they're going to be happy moving on to the next round, but I'm not exactly sold that this team is still anything above, like, bottom five, which is, you know, not, it's, it's good enough to get past bottom four, but I'm just not entirely sold that they're going to be able to beat anybody that's still in the upper bracket right now. Either way, they're going to be incredibly excited that they were able to win a best of three against the Challengers team. Basically, no matter how you look, that is always going to be a nice accomplishment to have, and AoE is going to be one of the few provisional teams to be able to get that this split. And then moving into our third series of Losers Round 1, we have another interesting one, one between two teams that uh, probably are on different trajectories, and that definitely showed probably the biggest blowout so far. We had Immortals Challengers taking on FlyFam, and Immortals Challengers does get the job done. They absolutely should have been the team to come out here and beat FlyFam, and they were, to their credit. I thought they played one of their better series of the entire year, if we're being entirely honest. Yes, it is against a worse team and a team like FlyFam, but they utterly dominated the series. All five of them really came out and looked great. It is worth noting, Yasui seems to be in full time now. Balulu obviously has taken the main roster spot. He was still playing a bit for Immortals Challengers, but, you know, they brought Yasui in. They wanted to try and get him acclimated. It seems like he has been acclimated, and he will now be the starter, I assume, for the rest of the playoffs for this Immortals Challengers team. And he looked really good in this series. We'll get to him in a second, but let's kick it off with my player of the series, and that was a pretty easy choice in this one. It's going to go to Chad, and that is a really good statement to make. I've been very critical of Chad throughout the year so far. I've liked him as a prospect before, but I thought last year was a little bit of a step down from what his 2021 was, and I think 2023 has been a continuation of that. It just hasn't felt like he has broken out in the way that I think a lot of us really hoped that he would in that jungle position. You know, he's always looked good as a prospect, especially when he's able to get to late game, but it's more so just been about the consistency for him. There are going to be some games where he just doesn't play nearly as well, and it's frustrating because we know that he's talented, and we know that he can be one of the best junglers in the league, but this was the performance that we were looking for. We were looking for games like this on a champion like Viego. He controlled the map. He did a fantastic job of generating pace for the team, and was he a little over-aggressive at times? Yes. But is that super positive when your team is super far ahead? Yes, especially on a champion like Viego, where typically speaking, you're going to be able to make something out of nothing. Uh, Chad was just really, really good. He out jungled Hyper a considerable amount in the series. Hyper was also out looking for plays, let me tell you. He died a lot in this series, but Chad was a big proponent of that. He was capitalizing on a lot of the mistakes that Hyper was making on the other side and doing a really good job to push Immortals forward. If they get a performance like this, out of their jungler a lot more often. This team is going to win a lot more often. Chad has just been ridiculously inconsistent, but these are the performances I think we were all waiting for. I already talked about it a bit as well. The solo laners both looked really good here. Yasui, in particular, two games of Annie looked really, really nice. I really like to see him meshing well with the rest of the team. It seems like he played off of Chad really well. He wasn't making egregious errors. He wasn't mispositioned and out of sync with the rest of the team. Those are the things you're really looking for for a player that has recently joined up with the rest of the roster. So I really like that showing from jungle mid here. And then I actually thought ADD was really good in the top lane. Two games of champions that you know, other players aren't particularly picking. Maybe in the NACL they are, but, you know, meta top laners in major regions aren't exactly picking Malphite. They're not exactly picking Rumble right now, but ADD knows he can pull them out, go into a player like Lunasia who's going to take a bunch of risks. Some of them are going to work out, some of them are not, and he knows he can consistently generate a lead, and that's what ADD was able to do. I would say top side of the map was really good, and that's not to take away from the bot lane either. I thought the bot lane was also incredibly solid. Wixie and Joey have been kind of the stable point. I would say for Immortals over the past few weeks, Wixie in particular, 
I think has slowly transitioned into being this team's most consistent carry. Now that Balulu has made his way up to the main roster, you can see that in the way that they draft around him. Yes, they go for the Viego in both games, but an Annie mid, a Malphite, a Rumble top, you're going for, going for hook champions like Blitz and Thresh. You need your AD to pick up here. You've got the Aphelius, you've got the Draven. Both of these champions can really take over a game and they're putting a lot of faith into Wixie and he is really paying it out. They were the much better bot lane in the series. I thought Wixie's Draven in particular was a lot of fun to watch, but Joey continues to be really good and really proactive in that bot lane as well. I think these two are a solid duo. There are a lot of really good bot lane duos in the league, so it's hard for me to say that they're like one of the best, but they're, they're definitely solid. They're not going to be a problem for this team. Overall, Immortals is quite a fun team to watch, and I imagine they are going to keep getting better. Schedule's going to get tougher, so it's not exactly going to be easy for them from there on out, but... This is a good win. It's a win they should have gotten, and it's a win they did get. As for FlyFam on the other side, they're just not very good. A very similar boat to what we did uh, with CLG Faith earlier, where obviously that team took a game, this team not able to, but uh, really the circumstances are very similar. Both are just outmatched in terms of talent at this level, and I think that was shown off here basically in every single role. You could give Dud of the Series... To almost anybody, Hyper was the one who got overextended and killed a lot. Blaze kind of got beat up a lot in the mid lane. I think the bot lane lost, but I'm going to give it to Lunasia just because I, I can't even think of a positive play that Lunasia ended up making throughout this series. Yes, Hyper, Blaze, even a player like Sword probably made more negative plays than a player like Lunasia over the course of these games, but at least Hyper was out there trying to make plays on the Wukong in game too. At least Blaze was following up on his jungler, even if they were not impacting the game in a positive way. At the very least, they were trying. It felt like Lunasia just got run over in that top lane matchup and then just kind of did nothing for the rest of the game. And that's kind of been the big problem. I I'm much lower on Lunasia as a player right now. Obviously, I see the upside. I see everything that everyone else sees. When he gets those solo kills on the top lane, he is a really fun player to watch who has a really good set of mechanics. It just doesn't seem like he has a really good idea of how to use those mechanics at this level yet. Can he grow into somebody who can do that? Absolutely. It just doesn't feel like that's going to be in 2023. But generally speaking, it was mostly a team gap. There's really not one person that I can point to on the side of FlyFam that was the big underachiever for this team. None of them really stepped up to the plate in the series. And again, it's just kind of expected. They were one of the three teams that... I don't think really people had any sort of expectation for, and uh, they're going to be fighting for their lives in the relegation tournament. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to go. There are a lot of good amateur teams out there right now, and FlyFam didn't exactly impress. They did get better, though, as the season went on, and I thought they showed some of their best gameplay in the final week of the season. So it'll be interesting, but if I had to guess, I would say this team is probably not going to be in the NACL next split. As for Immortals... Their season's not over yet. Their split is not over. Again, like I said, it only gets harder here. You're going to have to play somebody who's losing in that upper bracket, which is just not an easy game, basically, no matter who you face. But this team does have some upside. I like how Wixie and Joey are playing. Yasui seems to have fit in well, and him and Chad seem to work together well. ADD can play well. It's just not going to be consistent unless he gets into, like, a really weak matchup. Overall, Immortals is a solid team, but maybe not one that I'm expecting to win a ton of series from this point onwards. And then moving on to our fourth and final game here of Losers Round 1. The final team to be eliminated in the bottom four will be determined by this series. And we had a good one with CLG Challengers taking on Team Liquid first. And predictably, CLGC does pick up the 2-0 win. And this was a little bit of a stomp. It wasn't really all that close, but... Truthfully speaking, CLG should not be in the lower bracket anyways. They got upset by TSM in the upper bracket. Not really something a lot of people, me included, saw coming. This team is a lot better than basically anybody else we've talked about in this video up until this point. And they proved that in this series, going up against a very weak Team Liquid first. One of the teams that I would consider to be the weakest left in the tournament. I actually think they are weaker than a team like FlyFam that we just covered. They especially weren't very good towards the back half of the split. It really felt like they got worse as time went on. Mia came out, LJX came in, and honestly, it felt like that was not an upgrade to the team. That uh, honestly feels like it made the team a little less cohesive in the long run. I understand that maybe it was Mia stepping down rather than LJX being like the replacement, quote unquote. But either way, TLF definitely not looking strong over the last few weeks and CLG definitely taking advantage of that in this series. It was a dominant two games. Game number one never felt close really at all. A complete and utter stomp from the side of CLG basically from moment one onwards. And then game two was also a stomp, but it was a little more drawn out. Some more aggressive plays, some more crazy, you know, engages. It definitely got CLG a little bit of street cred. Uh, maybe it wasn't the cleanest game in the entire world, but at the very least, it was more fun. 
There's really not one particular player to talk about on the side of CLG as being significantly better than any of the others. Everybody on that side played incredibly well in this series in both games. They just kind of dominated. Everybody won lane both games pretty hard, and there wasn't really a lot that TLF could actually do about it. I do have to give a player of the series, though, and that to me has got to go to Meech for that game number two on the Aphelios, where he was just absolutely deleting people towards the back half of the game. TLF go for some interesting comps. They pull out the Rumble Jungle that they played a bit in the playoffs up until this point in game number one with the Vigar, the set. Really interesting comp here, but Aspect gets obliterated in the mid lane matchup. LJX and Rovex don't really have any sort of pressure with the Vigar in the bot lane, and the Rumble is certainly not going to be able to duel the Viego at any point, and so they just end up losing early there. And then game number two, they go for something a little bit more standard. They stay with the Vigar in the bot lane, but I actually think that it's more playable into something like Aphelios than it is into Zaya. Then you've got the Jace, you've got the Jarvan, you've got the Kennen, you've got a good amount of damage on the top side. Unfortunately, again, every lane just kind of loses, so you lose pressure early. Credit to CLG, I think they honestly just outdrafted them and really just outplayed them. There's really no other way to put it. CLG is just the better team. It was every aspect. Meech kind of obliterated LJX in the bot lane on that Aphelios, the mage bot. Could theoretically work. I honestly think it's an archetype that is generally underused in terms of pro play, but it just did not work in this game. There really isn't a lot to point to that was super positive. I think if any lane worked, it was probably bot lane, but Meech got super far ahead. Breezy had a phenomenal game on that Thresh. In game number two, those hooks just could not miss in the mid game, and it really created a lot of pressure. Of course, anybody who follows the channel knows how high I am on a player like Copy, just in general. Jenkins was really good. I actually think Jenkins has been much better over the last, like, three weeks or so. I hadn't really talked about Jenkins all that much on this channel, first of all, because he's a top laner in the NACL, and typically speaking, you're either, like, inting or dominating if you're one of the top laners that gets talked about in the NACL, and Jenkins was just kind of middle of the pack, I would say, for most of the year, but over the last couple of weeks, it really does feel like he has gotten a lot more comfortable. He's had some more breakout games. I think he's really gotten better at taking advantage of some lesser talent. Not that Surdy is bad. I think he's by far the best player on TLF here, but Jenkins is a solid player, an LCS caliber top laner, and I think he proved that again here, stealing the NAR away in game, or the NAR, the Rumble away in game number two and looking really good on it, and even taking the Gragas in game number one. Just generally a good sign for CLG here, and then Kevy continues to be underrated, facilitates the rest of the team, a great Viego game in game one, a really strong early game on the Lee Sin, and then just letting his laners go to work in game number two. Basically everything you could have wanted out of the CLG team you got in this series. As for TLF, they're just not very good. Again, I think they're probably the second worst team in the league, only above CLG Faith. Um, and so I didn't really expect them to be able to take a game in a series like this. And they lived up to my expectations. They were not very good. My dud of the series is going to go to Aspect in the mid lane. He's had some ups and downs. It's been mostly downs. I think you can make a real argument. Aspect has been the worst mid laner in the NACL in 2023. He is at the very least in the conversation, but the bot lane has continued to be the worst bot lane in the NACL. City Witty had a really poor end of the year, in my opinion, and that only was exacerbated once we got into the best of threes. I think Surdy was kind of the saving grace for this TLF team. I think at times Mia was also pretty good for this team, but Surdy was really the only one that was like dragging this team across the finish line. And basically every single series where they looked competent, it was playing through that top lane. And I do think that Surdy is a player that should be picked up by a team that plays in the NACL next split. I just don't think that's going to be TLF. They are now going to have to fight for their lives in the relegation tournament, being one of the bottom four NACL teams guaranteed, being knocked out in the bottom four here. And I would just, again, very similar to CLGF, be surprised if this team was actually able to take down some of the amateur teams that are looking really, really good in the NACL qualifiers right now. And so, honestly, TLF had times in the season where they looked competent. They, you know, took some games off of their TLC team, uh, you know, a couple other teams that were uh, much better than them. But at the end of the day, they just could, they, like the talent gap caught up to them eventually. And I think that's what the series kind of was. As for CLGC on the other side, this team should continue to run a bit here. Obviously, games are not going to get easier. You're playing teams that won in the first round of the upper bracket. But this team is one of those teams that has plenty of talent and plenty of experience winning games. It in order for me to feel comfortable that they can beat a team like Golden Guardians or whoever they end up facing in the next round. Copy is legitimately one of the best players in the NACL. Meech and Breezy, I think, have only grown as a bot lane, and we know Meech is probably the most mechanically talented player that we have in the NACL. Kevy's underrated. Jenkins has been playing better. CLG is not some walkover threat like maybe some of the other teams that won today are. I think they are easily, easily the best of the bunch from who we've talked about today, and uh, I expect them to continue to be either winning or a hard out for the rest of the playoffs. 
And then moving on to our winner's side of the bracket. We're moving on technically to round number two as we move on in this video. And round two kicked off with a matchup with the number one seed in the NACL taking on the nine seed as we saw Cloud9 Challengers taking on Team Liquid Challengers. And no surprise here, Cloud9 is able to pick up the 2-0 win. They have been the best team in the NACL basically all year long. And that is not slowing down anytime soon. It is certainly not slowing down in this series where they look pretty unstoppable. Even with the roster situation mid-split, you know, their mid laner getting pulled up to the main roster, them getting their main roster's mid laner. It honestly hasn't really affected the team all that much because the mid, the mid laner that they're getting in return is actually super freaking good because Diplex is just way too good for this level just like Eminus was. And so, big credit to Cloud9. They don't even really have to change their game plan all that much. It is worth noting, Diplex is a little bit of a different player to a player like Eminus. I know we've talked about that a bit. Diplex definitely more teamfight oriented. Eminus much more skirmish early game, dominating oriented, like he wants resources. Diplex not so much, but at the end of the day, it's not like Diplex can't get resources and, and then just carry the game. Because that's exactly what he did in this series. So, let's talk about it. Diplex is my player of the series on the side of Cloud9. He was awesome, going into one of the better mid laners in the NACL, in my opinion, in APA. And looking really good doing it. The Akali, the Silas, looking really solid. Two champions that weren't necessarily a big part of his bag when he was in the LCS. And so it's really good to see him pull it out here and just genuinely be really consistent on them. Yes, was he a little over aggressive in some trades in the game too? Maybe, maybe here or there they were a little bit too much. Him and Tomio though seem to have a really good chemistry together and honestly it seems like they make each other better and so that's a huge plus. He wasn't the only player on the team to play well. I want to give a huge shout out to Zazel. He's going to go super under the radar for how well he played the Nami in this series, but he absolutely should not. An unreal series coming out from Zazel, completely controlling bot lane, basically by himself. I've talked about this a bit, but Lucian Nami, generally speaking, is just not really all that strong right now. Globally, obviously, the nerfs hit the bot lane pretty hard, but even outside of that, people have figured out that just playing scaling lanes into them is just generally safe enough where you're probably going to hit the late game. Like, they're not going to be able to exploit you enough early to be able to generate that lead that Lucianami kind of needs right now. But when you've got two bot laners that can exploit that lead early on, when Zazel's playing this well in the 2v2 early, when Lost is a good enough player to be able to capitalize on that super efficiently, then it is still an incredibly scary lane to go into, and Zazel definitely proved that here. In 90% of series, Zazel would be my player of the series. I just had to give it to Diplex in this one because it felt like he was really good, but Diplex, Zazel, you could honestly give it to either. I thought both of them were phenomenal for Cloud9 in this game. Lost was still really good. Really no mistakes at all coming out from this bot lane that's not particularly surprising they don't really play to lose they play to win and that's a big positive for cloud nine tomio fake god even though the uh the stat lines aren't nearly as good as maybe some of their contemporaries they were making plays on the map as well fake god definitely was super influential on the side lane on that show gath and so everybody on cloud nine really kind of pulling their weight in this one and definitely proving why they are the number one seed and most people's favorites to take the entire tournament then for TL on the other side, it's a frustrating loss, but at the, like you can't be surprised. You're going up against a team that has been incredibly dominant, and guess what? They were incredibly dominant in this series. Unfortunately for TL, they just aren't good enough to be able to kind of keep up with that. I think they are a little bit better than maybe their record and their ranking would tell you, but... I still don't think they're one of the top teams in the NACL. They're not part of that upper bracket as I considered it. I thought Cloud9 was going to handle this series pretty easily, and they did. I think my dud of the series has to go to Kim Down. This bot diff was just too much. Support diff in particular was just a huge gap on the side of Team Liquid. They really had no way to be able to make up that. Zazel was dominating the 2v2, really creating a lot of openings for Lost to be able to generate strong gold leads into Arrow, and by the time you hit that mid-game where Jinx is going to start to power up, like, they were so far behind at that point anyways that there really wasn't a lot that they could do. Kim down on the Thresh was just not good. A very bad game one. And even worse game two on the Nautilus. Those engages just were not working out. That's unfortunately one of those champions where you pick Nautilus and you don't win early and you're playing from behind and that champion's going to look really, really bad because you're just going in to die. You really don't have any other option. There's nothing else that this champion really does. Um, outside of go in and die once you're behind. And so Kim Down, not looking particularly good in this series. I don't think it was necessarily like a big player diff. 
I do think it was a player diff in the sense that Lost and Zazel are really, really good, but this doesn't necessarily make me think entirely differently of Arrow and Kim down as a bot lane. I never really thought of them as a top tier bot lane in the NACL. Anyways, they were kind of a mid tier bot lane for me, and I think that was kind of established here. They could probably beat up on some of the bot lanes that are still left in the tournament, maybe on some lower teams, but I don't think that they are going to be able to compete with a team like Cloud9, unfortunately. Um, other players that were kind of underperforming, I thought Mir in particular had a really bad game number one on the Viego. He lost pressure super early on in the game to Tomio and was just never really able to recover that. He had a much better game number two. He actually kept up and was a big reason that team was actually in it in game number two, but game number one wasn't particularly good. Bradley APA, they didn't necessarily make any massive mistakes, but they didn't necessarily push the team forward in my opinion either. Bradley had some good plays. I don't want to take that away from him, but APA maybe not as much. It was just a little bit of a non-factor as opposing mid was definitely more influential than him in this series. Overall, TL obviously even losing this is not out of the tournament since we're in winners now. Um, they're going to be moving down to loser's bracket to play one of the teams that we just talked about. Unfortunately for Team Liquid, that is a very tough challenge because they're actually going to be facing CLG, which is certainly not an easy series. I would predict CLG would be able to take that one, but it would not be the first time that that team underperformed in the playoffs. TL definitely has still some magic up their sleeves considering their previous playoff runs and you can never count out APA as a player. Uh, he's just simply too good. As for Cloud9 on the other side, they've officially punched their ticket into the top four in the winner's bracket. That is really good. Obviously, it's not top four for the whole tournament, but at the very least, they are in a really, really good position to put themselves into like the top six, top eight as we get further along in this tournament. And that really was never up for debate. This team is way too good to be bowing out of the tournament already. They have proven that over and over again. They have some of the best players in every single role in the NACL and I really don't expect anything else other than sheer dominance and just winning coming from this team, even for the rest of playoffs. Then moving on to our second series of winners round two. And this one I was incredibly excited for. It's always fun when the two closest seeds face off against each other. And then this one, we had the number four seed playing the number five seed. We had Cincinnati Fear taking on Golden Guardians Challengers. And the Fear take it in three. They bounce back from going down in game number one to go back to back with the reverse sweep and take it in games two and three to win the series. A really great effort coming out from Fear because Golden Guardians definitely put their best foot forward in this one. Both teams playing at an incredibly high level and neither team should walk away from this feeling ashamed at all, especially Golden Guardians. They do not need to feel bad about losing this because they played great, unfortunately for them. The fear are just too damn good. It is unfair to go up against this team. They are playing really, really well right now. And uh, it's worth talking about. So let's go ahead and jump into it. My player of the series, how could it be anybody else? It's got to go to Trevor in that support position. I've been so high on Trevor all year long. And he proved me so right in this series on the two games of Thresh. Those two Thresh games were genuinely unbelievable. Some amazing plays, some great hooks. Some great flays, just great timings, really a great job knowing where he needs to be on the map. Trevor is so good at the game of League of Legends, and I understand that there are going to be a lot of people that say that he can't continue to grow and evolve as a player because somehow he's hit some sort of age threshold that we've made up in our heads for being too old for esports. First of all, obviously that's not the case. We've seen so many examples of that not being the case at this point that we just have to throw it out. If a player is continuing to improve every single year, believe them. It doesn't matter what age they are. Believe the tape. And that's what Trevor has continuously showed. But it's not just that. It's not just that he is improving. He is legitimately one of the best supports in the NACL. Full stop. I mean, not just provisional amateur supports. He is one of the best supports in the NACL period. He is really, really taking a new leaf this year. He's great in lane. He's great out of lane. He's great in team fights. He's just a really good player and he proved it again in this series. Yes, sometimes he was caught out a bit too much. He racked up a bit of the death total on Nautilus in game number one, but that's going to happen again. That's just kind of how the champion works. I think when you look at the impact that that Thresh had on the game in games two and three, it's undeniable that he should be player of the series, in my opinion. Obviously, the two carry roles were so great in the series as well, especially in game three. Shochi, Manui, definitely stepping up and really playing at an incredibly high level. The Vigar pick 
always fun to watch, but it really was about the Malzahar in game two for Shochi. Really great performance from him going into a mid laner who did have a bit to prove after a rough end to the year in Young. And Young proved it in this series. He stepped up, so it was up to Shochi to kind of match him in this one, and he absolutely did. Really great series from him. And then Manui. Manui has gotten to the point now where I'm just like, he's a top half ADC in the NACL, and I really can't see it any other way. He has been incredibly consistent. His positioning is a little off at times. He can be a little bit too aggressive, but... As I've said a thousand times on this channel before, I would so much rather you be too aggressive as an ADC than too passive. At the very least, go and try to make plays. Now, don't int, don't actively make plays that are bad, but if you go for that 50-50, that 60-40, I'm probably not going to criticize you for that because those are the plays that I want to see players making, and those are the plays that Fear makes really consistently. The bot side of the map was really good for them. Now, you'll notice I did give Dud of the Series to one of their players. I gave to Faisal in the top lane. I hate doing this. I really, really do. Sometimes I do have to give it to the winning side. And Faisal didn't really play all that bad. I honestly thought he played some of the team fights in Game 3 incredibly well on the Scion. The unfortunate part is that somebody in this series had to get that red name. And unfortunately, I just think Faisal had the smallest impact on the game as a whole. I thought Concept was actually really good in this series on the Malphite on the Singe, on the Gragas. I thought he was really solid, one of the more interesting players uh, that, you know, we have in the NACL. He really stepped it up for the series, and there was nobody else on Golden Guardians that really felt like they were deserving of the award, if I'm being entirely honest. So it goes to Faisal, even if in 99% of series, like, this kind of performance would not get you that. I just didn't love the Renekton in Game 2. It certainly wasn't, you know, the best performance I'd ever seen on the pick. And then the Cassante in Game 1, wasn't exactly standout either, but some of the Scion team fights was aw were awesome in Game 3. I don't want it to seem like I'm low on Faisal or anything like that. That is certainly anything but the case. I'm really, really in on every single member of this team of on the Fear. And there's a reason that they're in the top four, and it's because not only are they really talented individually, but they work really well as a unit. This is a really genuinely good team, and they proved it again here. As for Golden Guardians, again, nothing to be ashamed of in this series. This team played incredibly well, considering the circumstances. When you're looking at a team that is losing the final two games of the, of the you know, series, you're, you're maybe looking at a team that disappointed, maybe fell off a bit, but you cannot say that for Golden Guardians, especially this bot lane. Array and Prismal came to play in this one. I'm so high on Array as a bot laner now, and, and Prismal's always been someone that I've been incredibly hyped on, and they came to play in this series. They were definitely pulling their weight, and they almost single-handedly, or double-handedly, I don't know, won Golden Guardians this series. They were awesome. Prismal's game one on the Thresh was great. Array just played every single game nearly perfectly. Great positioning, incredible damage output. Young is in a similar boat there. I thought he was really good for most of this series. Not a lot of things to complain about. I thought both him and Shochi really stepped it up. Rosethorn had moments where he looked solid. Concept, in my opinion, was the better top laner in this series. There's not a lot of negatives that I can genuinely give this Golden Guardians team. I think, unfortunately, one of these teams had to lose, and it just had to be Golden Guardians in this series. They are going to be just as strong in lower bracket, though. I don't imagine this is going to be the end of the momentum train for this team. They are going to continue to play incredibly hard, and I would not be surprised to see this team continue to go far in this tournament. But for the fear... It's really testing time. They're going to have to face Cloud9 in the next round, in round three. That is going to be an incredibly difficult challenge, as you know, from what we just said about C9. But if any team has the mojo, the momentum, the synergy, just the confidence to go out and get that done, right now, I really do believe that it's the Cincinnati Fair. Then moving on to our third series of winners round two, and this one did also not disappoint NACL with consistent bangers as we've gotten into playoff time. Not that anyone was expecting anything else. We had the two-seeded Dignitas Challengers taking on the seven-seeded FlyQuest Challengers. And Dignitas squeaks by with a 2-1 series win. Big for them here. I actually picked FlyQuest to win this series in my predictions. Really happy to see Dignitas get the job done and really prove that their regular season record was not a fluke, that they were not starting to trail off. And, you know, FlyQuest, for their credit, proved me right to an extent that they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the best teams in the entire league, like Dignitas. 
So really good showing out of both of these teams. Really liked what we saw. Let's go ahead and go over it. Just kind of an, a general overview before we jump into one team over the other because I actually do think this series had a pretty defined structure when you look at it that way. Game number one was super FlyQuest favored. They were the better team and it was by a lot. Spirax had an awesome game on the Vigar. He was obliterating people. Yuji generated a really large lead early for the team and then they never really looked back. Masu wins some. Everybody was looking good and Insanity in particular was not looking good. He had not been looking good in my opinion basically all split long. I still think he's an incredibly talented and good player. One of the more talented players in the NACL full stop. But I think this is probably his weakest split at this level up until this point, in my opinion, in terms of just production and performance. But all of that gets thrown away as we move into games two and three, which were just run by the big old dragon. The Aurelian soul coming in in games two and three for insanity. And he makes that dragon look incredibly strong. He walks his way to a player of the series for Dignitas, even after kind of struggling on that Annie in game one. Really just getting back to roots, this team getting back to playing around mid lane and really playing for the late game. That's something that Dignitas was doing earlier on in the year that they tried to transition out of as we got further along. They wanted to go for these more aggressive comps, specifically in the bottom lane. We saw a lot more Caitlyn, we saw a lot more of these Zaya pick, you know, a lot more of these early bot laners coming out for Dignitas and... I just don't know if that necessarily plays to this team's strengths. When I look at how this team likes to play the game and what they're good at, it's scaling. They like to scale and they like to team fight, especially. They are incredibly good positioners and they're really smart when it comes to the macro game. But sometimes they can get a little over eager in the early game. So to see them go to the ASOL, to see them go to the Aphelios, you know, that's the kind of stuff I really wanted to see out of Dignitas and they did not disappoint in this series for me. Spawn in particular, obviously someone who has gotten a lot of criticism over the year of 2023 so far for his LCS performance, but he's been awesome in the NACL ever since he returned. He's definitely more so a late game carry rather than someone who's going to dominate you in the early 2v2. And I could say the same thing about Insanity. I could say similar things about Hoon. I, I really do think this team benefits a lot from going team fighting and Insanity definitely showed that off. That A soul pick is so ridiculously broken when he is played at a top level, like when he is allowed to get all his shit off. He can just obliterate the entire enemy team by himself. Insanity probably played his best series of the entire year in this one, and he definitely earned player of the series. Spawn was still really good, especially on the Aphelios. I thought Diamond, though, was awesome on the two games of Thresh. I don't really love this bot lane going Caitlyn Morgana early on into a bot lane like Masu and Winsome, who are just going to... I don't want to say outskill you, but like they're incredibly good, right? You're, you're playing with fire, picking something that's going to fall off so hard in the mid game going into something like Varus and even something like Vigar or Lee Sin. Because if you do end up getting caught out, there's really not a lot of things that you can actually do about it with this bot lane. Black Shield can only do so much. And so really like the adaptation to go to the Aphelios Threshing games two and three. And it absolutely worked out. Diamond's so good at this hook champion spawn. Really consistent. XU was solid. I don't think he was like the superstar of the team or anything, but he's just been incredibly solid all year long, in my opinion, still maybe the best jungler in the NACL. And then Hoon, what a year Hoon's been having. He's genuinely one of the best top laners in the NACL as well. He was just much better than Philip, especially in that game number three, where it was incredibly noticeable. He's just a lot of fun to watch this year. He's not afraid to take fights. He's not afraid to play with his team. He really likes to be a little bit more active in the mid game. And I like that out of a top laner. We've seen top lanes kind of be a little bit 1v1 for way too long in this meta. I think it's really good for him to get out on the map and do stuff. So a lot of props to Dignitas. They showed a lot of things in this series that really make me excited about where this team's going to be going for the rest of playoffs. And they definitely looked like a team that deserves the two seed in this one. As for FlyQuest, again, very similar to what I said about Golden Guardians in the previous series. There's not really a lot of negatives to take away. I am going to give my dead of the series to fill up up in the top lane. It just felt like he kind of got outplayed by Hoon. He had a very bad game number three on the Scion, in my opinion. Really just wasn't accomplishing all that much. And the Fiora in game number two was definitely not particularly good either. I just don't think Philip really showed up in this series all that much, but I think realistically, you could give this to someone like Spirax just for that game number three, where he was doing negative damage on the Vigar. He was awesome in game one, though, so it's kind of hard to do that. Masu and Winsome definitely fell off as the series went on. Loved the Varus in game number one. The Jinx was still solid in game two, and then the Zaya just didn't exactly have the same kind of impact in game number three. I still think FlyQuest is a good team, and I expect to see better out of a lot of these carries, most specifically this bot lane, who I genuinely think can be the best in the entire league, but it just seems like it wasn't meant to be on this day against Dignitas. They are good, and like I said, they're probably going to demolish whoever they play in loser's bracket now, but it just was not their day to take down one of the best teams in the NACL, and that truly is what Dignitas is, one of the best teams 
in the NACL, basically full stop at this point. They have proven it, even Insanity, who I think was quote-unquote the weak link, as much as a week of a weak link as Insanity can be for the team up until this point in the season, had an amazing series. They're getting back to their roots. They're getting a playstyle locked in. Spawn and Diamond have connected really well. XU and Hoon are some of the best players in their position in the entire NACL. Dignitas is surely not a team you can underlook, uh, kind of like I did going into this week. No longer will they be uh, overlooked by my, me and the community. They are now definitely one of the best teams in the region. And that's going to bring us to our final series of the week here, our final winner's round two series. And it's the big upset from round one, taking on a legitimately strong team and getting tested again. We had 100 Thieves Challengers taking on TSM Challengers. And 100 Thieves pick up the win, the three seed proving that they deserve to be here. And they do so in relatively dominant fashion. I mean, they're just the better team. They absolutely should have been able to take care of business against TSM. And they go out and they do that in this series. Again, not a lot of people, me included, thought TSM would even get here. Their win over CLG was certainly unexpected. But it was a really good showing from them. I thought in particular their jungle mid looked good, which is very rare for this team, if we're being entirely honest. But 100 Thieves is just a different level, obviously. I already talked a bit about it. Darshan is in. That's really the only major change that 100 Thieves has had in recent weeks. Of course, Neo in for TSM. So both of these teams still trying to get acclimated to maybe some new players, but... 100 Thieves in terms of talent is just so far past what TSM is able to put out that the series really was never really that much in doubt. Uh, for 100 Thieves, though, let's go ahead and talk about what they did right. My player of the series, there's a couple candidates for this. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Pretty in the mid lane. The mid lane matchup was firmly in favor of 100 Thieves in this series, and that's not really a sentence that we have really said all that much over the course of 2023. I actually think 100 Thieves and Dignitas are very similar in terms of execution, Two teams that really want to focus on their bot lane with two supports that are veterans of the NACL space but are really carrying kind of the aggressiveness that the team likes to play behind. Two young junglers, I think uh, Dignitas maybe wins out in that regard, but, you know, 100 Thieves maybe wins out on the top side. You know, Sniper before, Darshan now, really, really talented and solid players, but both with kind of underperforming mids who have shown a lot of good things at this level in the past but haven't necessarily done so recently. Pretty kind of falls into that mold. Hasn't had the best of 2023 so far, but this might just be his best series of the year. Going up against Doxa, who, when he loses, maybe looks like the worst mid laner in the NACL. I know that there are a lot of other mids that can definitely contend for that title, but Doxa, when he loses, loses really hard. And that was kind of the case in this series. He just doesn't really recoup well, and I think Pretty was able to take advantage of that. Annie in Game 1, the victor in Game 2, both incredibly solid and incredibly simple for 100 Thieves. They knew that they could play around mid lane. They knew that they could get Pretty ahead, and then they could get him out on the map, obviously getting picks with both champions can be relatively easy alongside the Jarvan, because obviously Annie-Jarvan combos really well. You get the stun with Annie, and then you can go all in with the Jarvan, feel, you know, finish off the damage with something like Annie, and then you know, get that free kill, or, you know, if you go in with Jarvan and get the Cataclysm off on somebody, you can drop Victor W inside of it, and that's a free stun, and so, really, really good synergy, I would say, from the comps here, and Pretty and Yukino, you know, I think, executed it well. The other players to shout out on the side of 100 Thieves, obviously, are going to be the bot lane. They have been the driving force for 100T all year long so far. Unforgiven has proven multiple times that he is too good for this level. He is the best ADC here. I know people are trying to say that maybe he's a little bit overrated, and maybe he is in the sense that he isn't like leaps and bounds better than every other ADC at this level, but he is the best ADC at this level. He's, he's definitely a league above, if only in terms of consistency. He just doesn't really have bad games. He maybe has some games where the team doesn't focus on him nearly as much, and he doesn't have the same kind of takeover kind of instinct that maybe some of the other ADCs have or have more consistently, but... I, I can't remember the last time I was looking at Unforgiven as anything but an absolute positive for 100 Thieves in one of their games, and that was definitely true here. Destiny, I've talked about him at length on this channel at this point. You guys know if I had an MVP vote in the NACL, it would be going to Destiny. I think he was the most valuable player in the regular season to his team. He continued to look awesome here on some engaged champions. We saw the Thresh Nautilus swap in both games from both teams, and Destiny was just so much better than Dragku that it became incredibly noticeable, and as you can see, it gave Dragku the dud of the series. We'll get to that in a bit, but 100 Thieves is just cruising, man. They just are a good team. I'm not necessarily sure they have the same kind of breakout upside that a team like maybe the Cincinnati Fear have below them in the standings. Like, the Fear can have one of those games where it's just everybody's clicking and they dominate, but 
I feel like consistency-wise, 100 Thieves is never going to have a game where they're not, at the very least, one of the best teams in the NACL. And if you don't play up to that level, you're just not going to be able to get past them in a best of three or a best of five. They are going to be very dangerous for the rest of these playoffs. And I don't really see a lot of teams that are going to be able to stand in their way. As for TSM on the other side, though... They're okay. Uh, again, just not a great series, but it wasn't really ever supposed to be. If they were able to hang with 100 Thieves, they would be way overachieving anything that they were able to do in the regular season of this split. Hanser's still good. He had a decent series, but nobody else really kept up their side of the bargain here. Sven and Doxa went right back to regular season form by getting absolutely blasted by their counterparts in this game. They were both pretty bad in the regular season. That showed here. Neo's been really good since he came into TSM, but with the rest to the map losing it's pretty difficult for you to have any sort of impact on the game and drag who just got embarrassed in this one if only for the fact that he was going into destiny he swapped champions and so he got to play both versions of the nautilus thresh matchup and he got outclassed in both versions you can see that in the scoreline it's way more apparent in the actual vod though i recommend you go watch it drag who's going to get my dud of the series here just wasn't a very good one from him but generally speaking, this is just kind of what we expected from TSM. They really were not a team that anybody thought was going to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with 100C. And I still think that they can make some noise in the lower bracket. Of course, you know, the season's not over for them by any stretch. They can still continue onwards and... They get a pretty favorable draw going into the bottom bracket, getting to play a team like Wildcard, who, while they are incredibly talented, probably more so than TSM, are also incredibly volatile and can, you know, just kind of have bad games every once in a while. So TSM's definitely still in this in the tournament, but, you know, I think this proved that maybe the first round upset over a really good team was a little bit more of a, uh, a fluke rather than something to expect in later rounds. As for 100 Thieves, like I said, incredibly consistent, incredibly strong. I don't really have a lot of doubts about this team. If they lose the series, it is likely going to be because the other team steps up and plays really well rather than 100 Thieves underperforming. This is just not a team that consistently underperforms. Of course, I still want to see more consistency out of the jungle mid lane, but they were really good in this series, and I imagine they're going to be a lot better as the playoffs continue onwards. I just have a lot of faith in this team, generally speaking, and I don't really see any reason not to at this point. All right, that is going to do it for my NACL Losers Round 1, Winners Round 2 overview and analysis. We now know the first four teams that are officially out of the tournament and all of our matchups moving into the end of Round 2 and the beginning of Round 3. I'm excited to cover all of that in next week's video. We're going to be covering these a bit more loosely, probably the rest of the tournament. Obviously, I've tried to break these up into about eight series per video. That's going to last, but of course, there's not as many series, and so eight series per video probably means we're going back to about one a week, uh, which I think is yeah, probably fine. I think going over them about one a week should be good, but let me know what you guys think of that down in the comment section below, and of course, let me know what you thought of the video down there as well. What teams in the NACL are impressing you? What teams are surprising you? What teams are maybe underperforming what you were giving them credit for? I know Evil Geniuses is on that list for me, but I want to hear you guys' thoughts and opinions too. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. It really does mean a lot for the channel. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content. And then, of course, also, if you, were not, if you are new here, hit that subscribe button. Not only do I do NACL content, I do all four of the major regions weekly as well. And I'm not going to be just doing playoffs for NACL. I'll be doing playoffs for all four of those regions as well. So if you want a comprehensive Lolly Sports coverage channel, I am the one for it. I would like to believe we are the one for it. And so really appreciate you guys sticking around for it. Really does mean a lot. And I really do hope you guys are enjoying the content. But with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.